So in regard to pelvic health, we're going to talk about how pelvic floor therapy can help manage some of the bowel and bladder issues in Parkinson's. Just to talk a little bit about myself, I'm a University of Florida graduate who's been practicing since 2008. I've practiced uh, in inpatient rehab hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, and currently in outpatient neurologic rehab at the Fixell Institute, as some of you all are some familiar faces. I started my pelvic floor education and journey in 2015, and we're starting a pelvic floor program at the Fixell Institute where I've been for the last four years. So today's objectives are to understand the basics of the pelvic floor, um, how bowel and bladder issues are, um, what type of bowel and bladder issues they might find in Parkinson's disease, and understanding some of the conservative techniques for managing those issues, and how pelvic floor therapy can uh, help with that. And then also how to find a pelvic floor therapist in your area. All right, so what is the pelvic floor? The pelvic floor is a group of uh, three layers of muscles that are down in the bottom of our pelvis. And so these muscles are really important. They help us with uh, sexual and respiratory functions. They help us manage our blood flow and excess fluids. They also act as sphincters to our bowel and bladder, so they help us hold in our poop and our urine. So it's good things. And then they also help to support the organs in our abdominal cavity, and they give us stability for movement. So pelvic floor therapy is usually provided by an occupational or a physical therapist who's had additional schooling or education in pelvic floor therapy, intervention, evaluation, and assessment. So this is not a typical part of the OT or PT program, so it requires additional education. We address issues related to bowel, bladder, and sexual function, as well as pelvic pain. It's a very holistic approach. Um, so we look at specifically the impact of those muscles, as well as habits, routines, diets, um, stress management. So it's a big picture management for these issues. So Parkinson's disease. We all know it's a common movement disorder. Um, and as a result, we have our motor symptoms that are like stiffness, slowness, uh, imbalance, tremor, cramping, freezing, and then we have lots of non-motor symptoms. Um, and we're going to be focusing on the bowel and bladder issues that are part of that autonomic or that automatic nervous system. Um, and I have some stars there because um, sexual function is also part of the pelvic floor. And then also uh, sleep and mood issues can be greatly impacted by some of these other issues. So we can address some of them as a result of um, addressing any bowel or bladder issues. Um, so why do we want to address bowel and bladder issues? Uh, because we know it can impact sleep, it can impact mood. Uh, if we are having issues with rushing to the bathroom or going to the bathroom many times at night, it can help with fall risk. Uh, it definitely impacts our mobility. It can impact our socialization, our desire to leave the house or uh, go to social events uh, and our general comfort. So we're gonna start with bowel function first. So this is how the average normal healthy bowel system works. It usually takes about 30 to 40 hours from eating to poop for the average bowel system. And so this process starts as soon as we start putting food in our mouth and the saliva is working on our food and we're chewing. And the act of chewing our food actually starts this uh, automatic process of peristalsis, which allows, it pushes our food down through our GI system. As it goes from our mouth through our esophagus to our stomach, it's digested by um, enzymes and bacteria. It moves into our uh, small intestines where there are more enzymes breaking it down. Uh, and then into our large intestines and our colon is where fluid or water is absorbed out of the stool to make it harder, more like it's ready to come out. And once it enters the colon, then um, it starts to stretch down towards the rectum. And when we get a feeling of stretch in those muscles, 
uh, in that tissue, then it starts to actually release a little bit of whatever's in our rectum into what we call the uh, anal canal. And at that point, our body decides, is it liquid, is it gas, or is it solid? And when it makes that decision, our body then reacts as a result. So we have our external anal sphincter and our pelvic floor muscles that actually help to hold it in. And then until we get to the toilet and voluntarily decide to empty it. And when we sit down, then we, uh, we have an automatic relaxation of what we call the internal anal sphincter. And then we have voluntary control. So that's our own desired control to relax our external anal sphincters and our pelvic floor. So these are areas that we have some control over. And normally, that stool will pass without much extra effort or pushing. Now in Parkinson's, um, bowel issues with Parkinson's um, can be related to that difficulty of relaxing those external anal sphincter and the pelvic floor muscles. Um, it can also be related to slower GI, uh, slower movement through the GI tract. And all of these things on top of just being uncomfortable and not, not enjoyable is that it can also impact the absorption or the, um, the way that your Parkinson's medication affects you as well. Um, so detection of constipation is something that sometimes can be found up to 10 to 20 years before a diagnosis with Parkinson's. Uh, and there's some theories even that the gut might be where Parkinson's is starting. Uh, so the underlying cause of constipation in Parkinson's is not totally understood. We do know it can impact the coordination of those uh, sphincters and pelvic floor um, because of the parts of the brain that affect, uh, cause Parkinson's also control that part of our bowel system. But it seems to be that there's a lot more going on as well as slowing down the GI system. Uh, when we look at a slower GI system, we also see that we have issues with nausea, vomiting, uh, excessive fullness, uh, bloating, and abdominal distension. And then sometimes we can even have where we're not, we get malnutrition, so lack of, uh, of the proper nutrition in our diet because of dyskinesia, sometimes avoiding eating because of medication or nausea associated with the medication, loss of appetite, depression, motivation issues, loss of smell and taste can all impact whether or not we're getting proper nutrition, and that can also impact our, um, our GI system. The less we eat and chew actually slows down our GI system, so we can have that impact. So some of the complaints we see for people with Parkinson's um, in the lower gastrointestinal tract is that slower transit time. So remember, we talked about it normally being about 30 to 40 hours, where in people with Parkinson's, it's often closer to 44 to 130 hours, right? So the longer it's in there, the more water gets absorbed out of it, the harder it is. Um, decreased frequency um, for about 20 to 80% of people, uh, and that's uh, less than three bowel movements a week. Uh, and some of the numbers for constipation and Parkinson's shows as much as 80 to 90% of people complain about it. Uh, evacuation issues, so this is emptying your bowels, is actually getting things out. Uh, this once again can come about from that lack of coordination of those external muscles that help, um, help us to empty, is sometimes they contract when they're supposed to be relaxing. Um, and then it can also be impacted by, we have muscle rigidity, the pelvic floor can be affected by those muscles, and then our postural changes can definitely impact how we're able to empty. Uh, diarrhea might be a little bit of the yo-yo effect from trying to manage constipation. So this is com a complaint about 21% of people on, with Parkinson's. And so that's kind of too little or too much laxative or managing those things. Fecal incontinence or losing stool without involuntarily. This can be common with diarrhea, right? The looser it is, the harder it is to hold. It can also be common with constipation because what happens is um, when we're more constipated, we get this uh, phlegmy liquid that comes up behind our GI systems trying to get things moving. And sometimes that can actually kind of seep around the hard stool and it can leak out. So uh, leaking fecal incontinence is not always associated with just diarrhea. It can also be a symptom of constipation. 
Um, and then we just have to remember that these issues are very common in Parkinson's, but these can also be common issues as we age and with other issues. So one of the things we know is that uh, managing constipation is looking at it from many different levels. And then some concerns we have to be cautious about is uh, constipation can contribute to ileus or bowel obstruction that can ultimately lead to a uh, need for hospitalization or sometimes surgery. Uh, so some of the medical management, so what your doctor might do with you to help manage your constipation are recommending probiotics. Some of the research for probiotics has been pretty variable, but for the most part there is, uh, seem to be minimal side effects. Um, stool softener recommendations, laxatives, enemas, and suppositories. Um, actually, deep brain stimulation of the uh, nucleus of the subthalamus has actually been shown to show benefits to um, constipation. Not typically the main reason you would get DBS surgery, uh, but it could be a secondary benefit. Um, working with a nutritionist, so getting a referral from your physician might be a good idea to be able to look at diet and the impact on that. And then there's some newer research looking at Botox, particularly to these um, muscles uh, on the lower end of your GI tract, like the pelvic floor muscles or the external anal sphincter, but that's a little bit variable right now because there's not a lot of research on it. So the main thing is, though, if you have any sudden or even progressive changes to your bowel, um, bowel function, you just want to make sure you touch base with your primary care or your GI doctor uh, just to verify that there's no reversible causes or disease or malignancy. Um, and having any sort of GI studies before you go to a pelvic floor therapist can actually be really helpful for making your treatment plan. <clears throat> All right, so now we're talking about how is pelvic floor therapy, why is pelvic floor therapy helpful for constipation management? So once again, we come back to that discoordination of those external muscles that want to squeeze instead of relax when we, um, when we go to the bathroom. And we know that this research has been great in the normal population as well as in with Parkinson's. So, um, According to research, lifestyle modifications such as adequate hydration, intake of fibrous foods, physical activity and exercise, and a regular bowel regimen are simple and effective strategies for managing chronic constipation in Parkinson's and should be considered the first line of treatment. So that would be pelvic floor therapy. So the first step if you come for, to us for uh, uh, pelvic floor therapy for managing constipation, is we're gonna talk about hydration. And this is a good thing to talk about in general with Parkinson's because it helps with so many of the symptoms. And there are a lot of recommendations for about how much to how much water to drink on a day-to-day -day basis, but I really find that sometimes this can be the easiest thing to do is to look at your urine. Look at your urine and see what color it is. If it's on this far end where it's kind of a darker brown or a dark yellow, you need more water. If it's pretty clear, then maybe you're drinking a little too much. My guess is most people are not drinking enough, so you're gonna be more on that far darker end. So you want your urine to be mostly clear with a little bit of a yellow tint to it in order to be properly hydrated. The next step is looking at fiber intake. So we need about 35 grams of fiber a day, and most of us only get about 15 grams of fiber a day. So we can use what's called the Bristol stool chart that gives us a little bit of a, an image of what, type, what your stool looks like to help decide what type of uh, fiber you might need. So on that type one and two, that's where we're real constipated and it's uh, harder and it's, um, and it's uh, dry, and so that is when we're gonna need more of the soluble fiber that helps to soften our stool. And then down on the farther ends, you're gonna have where it's looser and wetter, and that's you need more of the insoluble fiber that bulks up your stool, makes it a little bit thicker. So having the right consistency of stool is really important for helping to manage uh, any sort of lower GI issues. Um, and then you can look at the, the there's a website, prebiotin.com is a good resource for just looking at what types of fiber are in different types of food. And then also looking on your nutritional labels will tell you that information. 
Um, also, adding omegas or good fats into your diet is really helpful because it helps the stool slide along your GI tract. So things like nuts, coconut, fish, avocado, olive oil, things like that can be beneficial to add to your diet. Okay. The next thing, of course, we're going to talk about exercise. So this is looking just at generalized exercise for managing constipation. So about 25 to 30 minutes of exercise a day, particularly walking or cycling can often be some of the best types of exercise for managing constipation because you get that pelvic movement in, and rotational movement in your trunk, which actually massages your bowels to help soften things and get things moving. Um, so. Walking or cycling is really great, particularly after a meal, if you're having trouble going to the bathroom. Um, and then there is what we call the ILU massage. So you guys will be getting some handouts from our lovely assistants today, uh, which will include this massage. Um, and this is just a way to be able to actually massage and loosen the stool in your large uh, intestines. And it talks you through it. There are multiple types of bowel massage. This one tends to be the simplest. There are also uh, lots of videos online. Uh, but we're mostly going to be working on a counterclockwise motion. You're going to feel things. You might hear some gurgling. You might have some tenderness. Excuse me. But the goal is um, just to kind of get things moving along. So if you're really backed up, eating your food, going for a walk, and then doing some massage is usually a good way to start a bowel movement to, to happen, get it started. So the next thing we look at is positioning. So when, um, when we uh, go to the bathroom, the best position is our, the squat position, right? That's how our bodies were made to have bowel movements. Thinking about back way before toilets, we sit and squat on the ground because this allows one of the muscles called the puborectalis muscle to relax. And this can be a problem with Parkinson's because if you're having trouble getting up and down from the toilet, you probably raised your toilet up higher. And so what this does is when we're standing or we're sitting normally, the puborectalis muscle pulls tight around the rectum to help hold everything in. That's good. We want it to do that. Um, but it's not until we get in that squat position that we're uh, actually relaxed. And so otherwise, we're just pushing against ourselves to have a bowel movement. So what you need to do is to use either a step stool or a squatty potty or some other sort of uh, toilet uh, stool and have your knees above your hips and lean forward. You're generally going to have your mouth, jaw, and uh, lips relaxed, and you're going to try to relax your rectum. And then instead of pushing out against your belly, you're going to have it slightly engaged to give good pressure down without pressing hard. So straining is really actually counterintuitive for bowel movements because it can actually, once again, get some more of that engagement in the far end that makes it harder to empty. <clears throat> so if you do have trouble pushing or it's not getting started on its own, with that effort out, you're going to push your belly out and you're going to breathe out as you try to get things moving. Now, if you can't go, don't sit there forever. Get up, get moving, do some exercise or some massage, and try again later. Because the longer you sit there, the more pressures there are on that uh, lower pelvic floor. Is, that's where we end up getting hemorrhoids or prolapse issues. <clears throat> It's not working. Ah, there we go. <clears throat> so um, when it comes to going in to see a pelvic floor therapist, uh, there will be some um, different types of intervention. So there can be both internal work. So this would normally be through the anus for um, for bowel health, um, or external work. So it's not one or the other is necessarily required, but this can be helpful to address adhesions or scar tissue, trigger points, and muscle shortening that can impact your emptying. Uh, there's also what's called biofeedback. This uses an internal sensor to help you work on that coordination of relaxation and engagement of your pelvic floor to make sure you know how to relax when you need to and engage when you don't. And then a bowel diary might be helpful to help determine habits, diet, routine, and other factors that might impact your bowel function. 
And then the therapist may provide exercise like stretches or breathing to encourage proper relaxation and practicing positioning. Excuse me. All right. So now we're going to move on to bladder function. So normal bladder patterns are going about five to seven times a day or about every two to five hours. And then going to the bathroom at night is really none to two times a night. And that kind of depends on age. So the voluntary control of the bladder requires both an intact nervous system and cognitive function. So that tells us from the very beginning, bladder function is partly automatic, but partly voluntary. And so um, it's a learned behavior that we've had over time, right? That's where potty training comes from. It's something we've learned. So normally the bladder fills with urine from the kidneys. And as the bladder fills up, that it's a, actually a muscle called the detrusor muscle that actually stays relaxed because its purpose is not only to empty but also to store urine. And so as it fills up, when it gets to about a cup of urine inside, then we get our first urge to go to the bathroom, and that's about halfway full. In a healthy bladder and nervous system, that urge goes away as it fills up. It's more of a warning sign to tell you, hey, you should probably go to the bathroom in the next hour. And as it fills, the bladder stays relaxed, and the pelvic floor and the other sphincters in there are going to help, are going to be engaged to help hold our urine in because the, it's meant to store. And so as it fills, we're going to get additional uh, urges or feelings that we have to go to the bathroom that are going to get a little stronger every t as it gets more full. Once it gets to about two cups of urine, then we're like, okay, I probably should get to the bathroom. And this is, once again, the bladder stays relaxed and the pelvic floor and the external sphincters stay, are squeezing, holding things in. When we get to the toilet, those external, anal, the external urinary sphincters and the bladder relax and the, um, sorry, and the pelvic floor relax and then the bladder or the detrusor muscle squeezes to push the urine out. And this is normally enough pressure to get the urine out without any straining or pushing down further. Okay. So some complaints of bladder issues um, in Parkinson's are, um, so more than 60% of people complain of uh, fre frequent nocturia, or this is going to the bathroom multiple times a night. Urinary urgency in about 33 to 35% of people. This is where um, it's when you gotta go, you gotta go, right? There's no delaying that urge. Uh, urinary frequency in about 16 to 30, 36% of people with Parkinson's, and this is having to go uh, very frequently throughout the day. And then urinary incontinence is the difficulty holding your urine in or leaking. And that's a complaint in about 26 to 28% of people. And these are the storage issues, so issues with being able to hold the urine in. And then uh, there are some complaints of voiding issues, so actually being able to empty your bladder. And about 44% of men, they complain of difficulty initiating the urine stream. <clears throat> and this is men with Parkinson's. And then about 70% of men with Parkinson's report uh, poorer, weaker stream. And then about 28% of women report a need to strain to urinate. And some of these complaints might be related to um, comorbid issues like prolapse or uh, prostate issues. <clears throat> so the parts of the brain impacted by Parkinson's are also the part of the brain that tell your bladder to relax or stop and urge if you need to delay going to the bathroom. This can be compounded by habits, routines, diet, and environmental triggers. <clears throat> and uh, despite some of the uh, emptying symptoms, the voiding symptoms, uh, luckily people with Parkinson's tend to show that they're emptying completely. So we're not necessarily worried as much about uh, retaining urine, except in some more of the more severe types of Parkinsonism. Excuse me again. All right. So some typical uh, bladder management for, um, with your doctor might be specific um, bladder medications, over-counter medications, supplements, um, 
Once again, the STN deep brain stimulation has shown to have benefit for um, uh, the inhibition uh, reflex for the bladder. And so this might be a secondary benefit of uh, deep brain stimulation surgery. Uh, bladder stimulators have had kind of various benefits. Botox is also another area that's being started to look at, be looked at for uh, people with Parkinson's for managing bladder issues. <clears throat> and then there are catheters, diapers, pads. Um, when we're dealing with incontinence, we want to make sure that we are um, making sure that everything is clean and dry to help prevent skin breakdown or uh, infection. Now coming back to the um, your Parkinson's medication, one of the things we find is a huge variability in whether or not the Parkinson's medication actually impacts your bladder symptoms. Some people say, oh, I've started uh, Parkinson's meds, now I don't have as much urgency or I can hold my bladder more. Some people see no impact. So once again, we look at how there's multiple factors that are impacting bladder function, not necessarily just the specifics of uh, Parkinson's. <clears throat> All right, so once again, for bladder uh, management for pelvic floor therapy, specifically more urgency frequency or urgent continence, we're gonna be looking at um, the whole gamut of lifestyle, positioning, diet, exercise, uh, routines, uh, relaxation techniques. Uh, and then same as bowel, if you have any sudden bladder changes or even progressive bladder changes, checking in with your primary care doctor or your urologist is important. Any studies from your urologist can once again be really helpful for your pelvic floor therapist to know how to move forward with treatment. <clears throat> okay, so when we're the first step for managing bladder issues um, with pelvic floor therapy is actually looking at your bowels. So that's why we talked about bowel function first is our anatomy is actually that if you have, if you're constipated all the time, you're pretty backed up, then you can actually get pressure from your rectum onto your bladder so that you get actual pressure on it that can make you feel like you have to go to the bathroom all the time, make you have to go frequently, um, or even cause you to leak because they're that extra pressure. Sometimes, depending on how the stool is kind of blocking things, it might actually make it hard to get started to go to the bathroom too. So very often it can be helpful to uh, work on the, the constipation issues and then see what's left over in your bladder symptoms and see what we need to address specifically for that. All right, the next step is looking at diet again. Um, so these are a very large list of things that can irritate your bladder. Um, the ones with stars like alcohol, soda, coffee, caffeine, artificial sweeteners, spicy foods, those are pretty much ones that will irritate all of us. Some of these others are ones that might be a little more specific to you. The key is kind of thinking of finding out what your specific triggers are. Um, now I know some people can't do without their sweet tea <laughs> or their soda, and so one of the compromises I often make is thinking about making, excuse me, a water sandwich. So whenever you have your sweet tea or soda, just make sure you drink a glass of water before and a glass of water after. And the goal for this is to help dilute your urine, because the more concentrated your urine is in your bladder, then the more irritated your bladder is and the sooner your bladder wants it out. And so it's going to make it whole harder for you to kind of relax that urge to go to the bathroom. So diluted urine or lots of water will actually help you to hold more urine over time. So the next step is to talk about bladder training. And so this is kind of starting to teach your bladder what the right, um, what the right signs and signals of actually having to go to the bathroom are. So I always like to start thinking about I know most of you are probably retired, but thinking about when you're driving home from work, you're driving in the car, you get the, um, the driveway, get out of the car, walk to the front door, key goes into the door, and what's the first thing your body tells you you got to do? You have to go to the bathroom, right? <laughs> Is there any more urine in your bladder than there was a moment ago when you were sitting in your car? 
No, not really, right? So what's happened is your bladder has actually learned the habits that you have and says, oh, I'm ready for you. I'm going to help you go to the bathroom before you get there, right? And so we can use this in the reverse. So we can train our bladder so that it doesn't have as much of those urges. And so the first thing we do is we work on uh, training. So very often we'll talk to you specifically about your bladder habits and make a goal. But just for an example, we might say every two hours you're going to go to the bathroom whether you feel like you have to or not. And so the way that this works is you wake up in the morning, you go to the bathroom, you set your timer, and then while you're drinking lots of water in between, we know that your bladder is filling in that time so you have enough to empty. And then you're going to go to the bathroom whether you feel like you have to or not at that two hour mark. Every two hours during your waking hours, only while you're awake. And the goal of this is to start taking your bladders out of the equation. We don't want it to be sending you these wrong signals that you have to go when you're, maybe you're only half full. And so working on taking that urgency out of it can actually help you to be able to store more urine. Um, and so we also want to make sure then when we're doing this, we're avoiding going to the bathroom just in case. So if you're going somewhere, you might have to plan where a bathroom is when you go so that you can go at your two hour mark. Uh, so this takes some planning, but it can be very effective just within a couple days. And so this isn't a permanent thing either. Once you're successful about 80% of the time, you can start increasing your time by about 15 minutes and doing that for a few days and going up. So really don't recommend going more than about four, four to six hours is, is pushing it. So, uh, but you can make improvements in this and that regard. And then you're never going to delay a bowel movement. So you're going to kind of go to the bathroom even if it's not near two hour mark when you do that. And then once again, that two hours is just an example. Usually we would be working with you on kind of what your timing is to go to the bathroom. So on top of that, we would also be working on how to suppress that urge, so how to stop that urge when it comes if it's coming in between those two hour mark or whatever your time period is. And so the first thing we want to do is we want to stop because what happens is when we are rushing to the toilet, it kind of elevates our nervous system and so the bladder just gets excited and, and just gets, the urge gets stronger, right? So first thing we want to do is stop. If possible, we want to sit down because that pressure on our perineum is actually going to help to calm the bladder because it kind of t gets to that pelvic floor area and it tells the bladder it's time to relax. You know, think about little kids when they have to go to the bathroom, what do they do? They kind of hold themselves, right? It's because it works. So instead of holding yourself, you're just going to sit down and give that pressure. And then we're going to do a couple more things. We're going to work on our breathing to help relax the nervous system in our bladder. We're going to distract ourselves and we're going to engage the muscles near our pelvic floor to help um, to send a message to the bladder to relax. So I usually recommend counting backwards from 12. You're counting those 12 breaths as you go backwards and then you're either squeezing your buttocks or squeezing your legs together um, until that urge passes. And then once that urge passes, then you can get up and go to the bathroom. And that's important that we want to be going to the bathroom when you don't have a strong urge so that your bladder isn't getting that, that knowledge that like, oh, this is right, I'm feeling the strong urge, I need to empty right away. Uh, so we want to go when that urge is lower so that you have more control. Um, another technique that can be helpful, let's say you're aligned at the grocery store, you can't go sit down, uh, is also doing what we call the heel raises. So the muscles in our feet and lower legs are also attached to the same um, neural system that our pelvic floor is. So we can you use that same technique instead of the butt squeezes or the sitting, you would do the heel raises while you're breathing and counting. So the next step is if you're having to get up to go to the bathroom, this is usually three or, three or more times a night. Um, because once we start getting to that point, then your sleep is just very disruptive. Uh, so the first step is stopping your fluids about two hours before bed. And this is because you're hydrating really well during the day. You drank lots of water all day long, so you can stop your fluids about two hours before bed. If you need to take meds, you take it with small sips of water or wet your mouth with little bits. And then you're also gonna elevate your legs about 20 minutes uh, around that two hour mark. 
What happens is if we get any swelling or uh, water in our legs throughout the day, then the first time our body gets to process that is when we lay flat at night. So uh, elevating your legs around that two hour mark means that your body you can process that sooner before you go to bed. You're gonna go to the bathroom just before bed and on your first urge, remember those urges aren't always right. We wanna roll over and go back to sleep. And the purpose of the rolling over is sometimes that repositioning can actually kind of send the signals a little bit different or reposition where uh, you're getting that urge feeling. And so trying to let that pass. You know, this can be a little bit tough at first, so uh, definitely if you have people who are getting four times a night, if you do this, it delays you by 15 minutes each time, maybe you're just getting up three times a night instead of four, and you can slowly drop off those extra times. But this can be really effective, and it can be extra effective if you're also doing this with the daytime um, bladder training. Um, yeah. Um, some other techniques that can be uh, an additional modality for helping with uh, bladder urgency and urge incontinence is electrical stimulation, and this would be something your uh, therapist would be able to uh, show you how to use in the clinic, and then you would be able to use it at home. Um, it's generally something that aids in the other techniques. It's not just the, I can stem myself and then not have to go to the bathroom that often. All right, so additional treatments for bladder training might be manual work, once again. So this could be internal work or external. So massage, stretching, uh, scar management, uh, trigger point management, and then once again, the biofeedback and exercise. Um, and then the pelvic floor therapy is gonna provide specific exercises for you for the right proper coordination, relaxation, uh, strengthening of your pelvic floor muscles or other uh, postural muscles that can impact your pelvic floor's performance. All right, so these, I don't know if the exercise got handed out already, but you'll all be getting a copy of this. If you're online, you can uh, shoot me an email when you get uh, when we get to my email at the end to tell me if you'd like some of the copies we've been we've hung up, handed out today um, so what we look at for uh, with parkinson's particularly but really uh, a lot of bowel and bladder issues is flexibility of our postural muscles and the pelvic floor areas and so what we're looking for is we want good movement in our neck our chest thoracic area, our hips and legs, um, and we wanna be able to keep those moving so that the pelvic floor and the diaphragm can move easily to be able to have the right engagement and relaxation. So luckily, these are also really great stretches just for <laughs> managing Parkinson's and postural issues. So you can kind of get your bang for your buck with these. <clears throat> The next thing is, oh, we don't, it's not moving, but normally for this image, you would be able to see how the diaphragm of the pelvic floor and the di our respiratory diaphragm actually move together. So when we breathe in, then our, our pelvic floor is moving with our diaphragm, and as we breathe out, the same. So this is why when we are going to the bathroom or we're trying to relax the pelvic floor muscles, it can help to work on your breathing at the same time because those muscles work together. So practicing what we call diaphragmatic breathing at home can be really helpful. The first step is usually laying down with a hand on your chest and on your belly. If you guys want to try this now, you can do it sitting. You're going to have one hand on your chest, one hand on your belly. As you breathe in, you're going to feel your belly and chest lift and rise. And as you breathe out, you should feel your belly and chest kind of come in. And so we have not only our pelvic floor muscles and our diaphragm work together, but also our abdominal muscles and our back muscles help to kind of create this pressure system to allow breath out and stool and urine out as well, or helping to store those things. So working on that breathing to make sure, because sometimes with Parkinson's, it's hard to get that coordination can uh, make a difference in, in your bowel and bladder function. 
The next is we have where you can do specific pelvic floor strengthening, so that would require mostly an internal assessment of your pelvic floor muscle coordination and strength. Uh, but we also know that there's a lot we can do using the muscles around the pelvic floor or that are coordinated with the pelvic floor to be able to help with their strength and their endurance as well, just like we did with the stretching. And so the key is once again, we're gonna coordinate our movement with the exercises. So whenever you're doing the effortful exercise, you're gonna breathe out. Remember that abdominal muscles pull in, our pelvic floor engages, and that gives us more stability to be able to move on top of those muscles. So the key muscle groups we're gonna be working on are the transverse abdominus or the deep core muscles, our gluteal muscles, our hip, um, adductors and abductors, so in and out, and rotational movement, and then also our hip flexors. And so um, these are also part of the handouts and tell you detail how to work on breathing through it and working with or without resistance. Um, it can be real helpful for helping to make sure you have good coordination of your pelvic floor muscles as well. Um, in regard to pelvic floor therapy in Gainesville, so UF Health's Magnolia Park Outpatient Rehab is our primary center for um, pelvic floor therapy, um, but like I said, at Fixel, I'm establishing a program for pat our patients with Parkinson's there, so you'll be able to start going there for it. If you are out of the area, then I'm going to go through a couple websites that are good sources to look for pelvic floor therapists. So pelvicrehab.com is provided by Herman and Wallace, who puts on um, much of the pelvic floor education. And so you'll be able to find providers through their website. Um, the APTA, or the um, Physical Therapy Association, is uh, also has a women's health of PT locator, even though it's not just women's health, it's also uh, for men. Uh, and so mostly these are only going to be physical therapists. Uh, pelvicguru.com has uh, multiple types of providers that can provide pelvic floor therapy. And then you can even just use Google, search pelvic floor therapy whatever the name of your town is. Uh, another good option is just contacting your local hospital system and their outpatient rehab and ask if they provide pelvic floor therapy.